If there is a hell, I will be there for eternity, exclaimed the fake death note of Daniel E. Marino, chief financial officer of Bayou Group. This is the story of how Samuel Israel III defrauded investors of $450 million in under 10 years through his Bayou Hedge Fund Group. Let's go back in time and see how this situation happened. Born in Louisiana in 1959, Samuel Israel came from a stockbroking family. His grandfather, Leon Israel, founded a commodities company that was sold for $42 million in 1981. His family was wealthy and sent him to Hackley Prep School in upstate New York. Despite failing to graduate from Tulane University, Israel's family connections allowed him to secure a job as a junior trader at various Wall Street firms, including a minor role at hedge fund Omega Partners, run by billionaire Leon Cooperman. After his experience on Wall Street, Israel figured it was time to advance his career and start his own hedge fund. Israel partnered up with a man named Daniel Marino. Israel and Marino made a great pair. Israel was the product of Southern money and leveraged his last name and days among Wall Street titans to charm investors, along with his passion and edge in the markets. After all, he did come from a family with a reputation for successful investing. While on the other hand, Marino was an accountant with a bad hearing problem and a lisp. He pursued a career in accounting, drove a Alicid Maroon Nissan Maxima, and worked for a second-tier accounting firm. For wealthy investors looking to dabble in the world of hedge funds, this duo presented an ideal balance a big ego, and an accountant to keep it clean. Or so they thought. The fund was not an immediate success. It had an underwhelming year in 1996. To add to the growing tension, clients of the Bayou Fund found that Israel had the tendency not to communicate bad news. He would communicate frequently when the fund was doing well, and would go silent when the fund wasn't. In 1998, when the fund was not doing well, Israel devised a plan to recover the losses. First, Israel would raise new funds from investors and trade his way to outsized gains on the money. And most importantly, the commissions generated by the Bayou Funds trades, which were almost always executed by Bayou Securities, a brokerage firm owned by Israel, would be credited back to the funds to help offset the losses. Because Israel was known for his rapid fire trading, the commissions would be high. But this shady plan had one issue. It would not be able to pass through any legitimate auditing firm. So Israel found a new accounting firm called Richmond Fairfield, which was used to oversee the fake bookkeeping. This company was entirely fictitious. This strategy allowed Israel some breathing room and he was able to get creative with the way he marketed his hedge fund and charged clients. Israel did not charge the typical two and 20 model that most hedge funds use. The two and 20 model is when a hedge fund charges 2% on your assets in the fund and 20% of profits. Israel just charged 20% of profit. He also made the minimum investment 250000 which was much smaller than what most hedge funds required at the time. This decision helped to grow the hedge fund. They brought in a considerable amount of new capital from investors. Other parts of Israel's career and the operations at Bayou were manipulated to fool investors, while documents were given to prospective investors in 2003, said that Israel started Bayou funds in 1997. Some early investors said the fund opened it a year earlier, in 1996. It makes sense as to why Israel would want to change the origin date of the fund, seeing that they had poor performance in 1996. With this plan in place, Bayou reported its 1998 performance to investors as an astounding gain of 17.55%. Israel got investments from some of his family's connections at Tulane University, and the ball started rolling. Tremont Capital Management, a well-respected fund manager, invested in Bayou around 2000, although they redeemed their investment a couple years later. In 2001 and the year following, Bayou's assets really started to grow when consulting firms started recommending the fund, consulting groups such as Millennium Wave Investments in Texas and Hennessy Group in New York. One aspect of the Bayou Fund that raised red flags for investors was that his brokerage firm, Bayou Securities, executed all the hedge fund's trades and put him in a position to profit at the expense of his fund clients. Israel realized this could concern investors and tackled the potential issue head-on in his marketing materials. Although the goal of the setup was to reduce trading costs, the materials acknowledged that it could lead to higher costs and greater profits for Israel. By confronting this problem head-on, Israel disarmed many critics. To some investors, the fact that Bayou Securities was registered with security regulators and subject to regular audits was enough to ease their worries. 
The money was pouring in. Both Israel and Marino began living lavishly off the success of their hedge fund. Marino got rid of his beat-up Nissan Maxima and Staten Island address. In October of 2003, he moved into a six-bedroom mansion in Westport and started driving a Bentley. The same year, Israel moved into the Mount Kisco estate built for H.J. Hines, the ketchup magnate. On the outside, it appeared that the fund was doing great. Falsified market beating gains of 26% in 1999, almost 20% in 2000 and 7% in 2001. Some of the consultants who had recommended the fund to their clients were becoming wary about aspects of its operations. In 2002, Tremont withdrew funds after noticing a sizable gap in returns between Bayou's offshore performance and its domestic performance. When asked about the discrepancy, Bayou explained they shifted profitable trades made in the United States funds to the offshore portfolios in an attempt to increase the offshore funds performance to attract more investors. Israel and Marino were not pleased to see investors redeeming their investments. This was never part of their plan. This stress associated with redemptions was reflected in other financial statements filed by Bayou Securities. It started to become obvious that both companies were heavily intertwined. For a brokerage firm like Bayou Securities to do business with clients, regulators require a certain amount of money to be kept on hand. In March of 2004, Bayou Securities had a net capital position of 5.9 million and had borrowed 9% of that amount according to filings. Net capital is the amount by which current assets exceed liabilities. By December of the same year, the firm's net capital position had fallen to just 259,000 and at the end of March of 2005, it had reduced further to $164,000. At this point, Bayou Securities borrowings represented 161% of its capital. This is extremely high and was putting the company in jeopardy. For the year, the firm showed a loss of $325,000. But the financial situation Bayou Securities found itself in was not a result of bad risk management in financial markets. Rather, it was a result of lavish spending. Their financial filings showed they paid for limousine services, $5,000 per month, restaurant meals, $4,000 per month, the lease of a private jet for $100,000, and even the services of a counter espionage consultant for $20,000. Some of the biggest amounts spent paid for consulting and professional fees. These payments were usually around $60,000 per month. But by March, they jumped to $431,000. And by the end of June in 2005, Bayou Securities had paid out $1.1 in consulting fees. These payments mainly went to equity research for stock research and legal fees. Israel decided to close the fund in July. A few months later, on December 4, 2004, the fund's board met and adopted the solution of allowing Israel to hold $100 million in his own name to invest. The board was conveniently made up of two people, Israel and his right-hand man, Marino. This move appears to have been the start of a last-ditch effort to save the fund and recover multiple years' worth of losses. In March, Israel entered into an agreement with Louis Malouf, a managing director of Bayou, to invest the $100 million in bank instruments that would supposedly yield $7.1 billion over 10 years, saving the fund. Israel's quote-unquote friend tells him about some secret government projects that are financed by select banks and available on an invite-only basis. If you buy in, you are guaranteed an incredible rate of return. The FBI analyst Kevin Walsh says Israel's contact was a shadowy figure. He'd told Israel that he was an ex-CIA officer. He was involved in black operations. Lots of super secret stuff. Israel bought this hook, line, and sinker. Israel buys in for an initial $10 million and becomes a victim of a high-yield investment fraud scam. Part of the scam includes this box. This was given to Israel as collateral. Supposedly, it is from World War II and contains more than $100 million in Federal Reserve bonds. The only catch is, the Federal Reserve issues notes, not bonds. This box was a hoax. An FBI investigation is triggered when Israel wires more than $150 million, which is essentially all the money they have left to the unidentified con man. Agents interview Israel under the assumption he is a victim, but the more questions the agents ask, the more they realize that there is something else going on on besides prime bank fraud. Israel is running out of time. On July 27, 2005, he sent a surprise letter to investors announcing he is shutting down Bayou and will send checks to investors. But Bayou has no money to send. 
The U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission filed a complaint in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York on September 29, 2005, alleging misappropriation and fraud involving the Bayou Hedge Fund Group. Israel pleaded guilty in 2005, and Bayou filed for bankruptcy in May of 2006. On 14 April 2008, Israel received five years in prison for conspiracy, five years for investor fraud, and 20 years for mail fraud. After the sentencing, the judge let Israel remain free until his June 9, 2008 surrender date, and his punishment was reduced to 20 years. The day Israel was due to surrender to authorities for his sentencing, he faked his death. He wrote, suicide is painless in the dust on the hood of his car and parked it on the Bear Mountain Bridge just north of New York City in Westchester County. Since no body was found, the entire world went looking for Israel and everyone was talking about his disappearance. The United States Marshal Service termed him armed and dangerous and issued a wanted poster. No body turned up and the marshals questioned a driver whose car was seen near the area where Mr. Israel had abandoned his GMC envoy, leaving behind the car keys and a bottle of pills. In addition to the marshals, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the United States Attorney's Office, which oversaw the case, were involved in the search. Former prosecutors and other law enforcement officials say that along with monitoring airports and border crossings, the police check credit cards and cell phones for any activity in fugitive cases. They also track the phones of friends, family, and in some cases even lawyers. It turns out, he hid on a campground in Massachusetts for a month before he surrendered. On July 2, 2008, Israel arrived at the Southwick, Massachusetts police station on a motorized scooter and surrendered himself. He had been living at a local campground since his faked death almost a month earlier. Reasons why he gave up? Drug addiction, shame for his family, and possibly the fact that he saw himself featured on America's Most Wanted. Today, Israel is serving time in the same prison as Bernie Madoff in Butner, North Carolina, and is scheduled to be released on October 5, 2027. Do you think Israel should have gotten a more lenient sentence? Let us know in the comments. Make sure to like and subscribe for more business content.